This episode is brought to you by the House of Chanel. Join us for Chanel Connects, the Venice Biennale edition. We've taken up residence in Italy to introduce you to the artists, curators, thinkers, and makers behind the world's most important exhibition of contemporary art. Guests include actress Vicky Creeps. I've been trying to push myself to a place where I let go. Artist Julian Creuset. My studio looks like a secret kitchen. And renowned gallerist Sadie Coles. The main thing is to keep your ears open. <laughs> Listen to Chanel Connects on Chanel.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And it would remind me to kind of be wide-eyed in the same way that they're wide-eyed, because I think that that should be how we all feel in the mat. We should all feel spun around inside that place. I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. It's every art lover's dream. Just imagine being alone after hours inside one of the world's most august art museums. Away from the throngs of selfie stick wielding tourists and the din of the crowd, it's just you and the masterpieces. That dream was a reality for the 10 years that author Patrick Bringley spent as a guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which a lot of people, myself included, consider to be the greatest museum anywhere. Now, he's sharing that experience and a lot more in his new book, All the Beauty in the World, The Metropolitan Museum and Me. Chronicling the daily realities of working at the treasure and tourist-packed institution, the book is also a deeply personal story and, for all intents and purposes, a love letter to the Met. It really covers the gamut, from getting to know virtually every corner of the sprawling museum, to having a front-row seat at the installation and display of the world's premier art collection, to forging relationships with the tribe of fellow blue-suited guards that he eventually came to see as family. This week on the podcast, Artnet senior market reporter Eileen Kinsella spoke to Brinley about how his time at the museum intertwined with his personal life, starting with the tragic passing of his older brother and ultimately ending with his finding true love and starting a family, all against the backdrop of his second home at the Met. Hi, Patrick. It's great having you on The Art Angle. Thank you. It's so good to be here. You said in the book that you never forget your first visit to the Met. I personally agree. I think almost everybody I know who's ever visited would agree with that. You have a great tale about your first experience visiting there when you were 11. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So my parents liked to split us kids up and go on vacation just one-on-one with a kid every once in a while, you know, a special little trip. And my mom was an actor, a Chicago theater actor, but she had a friend doing a show in New York. So the two of us went there and I just remember that trip. I remember taking the train up to what seemed very far away and you're walking in this obviously very sort of fancy neighborhood with the doormen outside and everything else. And you approach the Met and you see this huge facade that you can't even see the whole thing. You can't tell where the beginning and the end of the building is, which I've always thought is kind of emblematic of the Met as a whole. You can't (laughs) sort of wrap your mind around this place. And you walk inside there and it's just the great hall is just loud with everyone talking about this and that. And you're waiting in line to get your little tin entry pin that they used to have. And then when you're in it, I mean, I I always give the advice that the first thing you do is just wander the place to get sort of a sense of its size and scale and breadth and all the different cultures, just one after another after another. And I think that that's principally what my mom and I did. We sort of galloped through it first to kind of see what was going to be around the next corner and the next and the next. That's great. Years after that, you worked after college at another great New York institution, the New Yorker magazine. Tell us about your time there. I sort of walked into that job and that I don't tell this story often, but I was a big Bob Dylan nut in high school. And I connected to Alex Ross, the New Yorker's music critic, because he was writing a Dylan profile and he wanted some kids opinion. And I was trading Dylan bootlegs on some message board. So I sort of walked into this sort of email correspondence with Alex Ross. And then when I arrived in New York, I got a job with him, helping him on this book he was writing. And then afterwards, I got this gig at the New Yorker magazine. And of course, I thought that I was, you know, on top of the world. I was working at 42nd Street and Broadway, when in reality, I was working for the events department. I wasn't a writer. And what would I have written? I was, <laughs> I yeah. was a kid. I didn't have a sort of voice. I hadn't kind of thought any sort of original thoughts. So in some ways, it was a great job to have. And I met wonderful people there. 
But in other ways, it was sort of a dangerous job to have because it sort of led me to believe that I could just sort of rest on these laurels. I somehow had been anointed. And, you know, a few years in, it sort of occurred to me like, man, this is just sort of an office job that is good in some ways, bad in some ways, but it seemed to be kind of fake in some ways in comparison to what I was going through with my brother. My brother got ill at that time. You were at the New Yorker for four years. By the time that your brother Tom's illness worsened, he was battling cancer. Can you tell us more about how that coincided with your decision to leave? I was there four years total, or a little less. He had already been ill for a while? Yes. There was a point when he started to get very, very ill. He had what's called a soft tissue sarcoma, which is a a somewhat rare form of cancer that happens for God knows what reason. And it was very serious from the get-go, but he had gotten to the point where I would want to spend a lot of time with him and we were all spending a lot of time with him in the hospital Mm -hmm. and also at home when he was at home. And I think that it was very clear that something very momentous (laughs) was happening there. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of my interests in sort of the arts and literature and things like that, which you would think that the New Yorker would be sort of a hotbed for thinking about those things. But sort of on the contrary, I felt like Where I was learning about those things was sitting around and we would read books out loud and we tacked up little pictures above his bed. And there was so much more meat there than there was in trying to write a talk of the town piece about some celebrity or whatever the heck. It was so much buzzier over at the New Yorker and so much more kind of down at the bedrock elsewhere that I felt like I wanted to be at the ladder. And the Met seemed to me to be one way I could. yeah. How did the Met first come on your radar? I went to NYU and I had a job at the Institute of Fine Arts Library, which is NYU's grad school for art history. And it's right by the Met. And John Meyer was the head of it. And he had been a guard in a past life. He had been a guard for five years or so. And I think that was the first thing that gave me the idea. I had always loved art. I loved the Met. I had always seen guards. I'd ask them questions and things. So it was something that was on my radar. Can you take us through the process of applying to become a Met Guard and what's the training like? I mean, obviously the security protocols are very high. Back in 2008, when I applied, they used to just post a job listing in the New York Times and they hire in classes. So I think my class was 18 guards or so because there's so many guards that there's a good amount of turnover, especially among sort of the newbies. So it used to be that every four or five months, something like that, they would bring in a new class of 18, 20, 16 guards, something in that range. We had a week of classroom training where you sit down and you learn all these protocols and then you have a period where you shadow another guard. So I begin the book my first day in uniform and I'm ready to shadow this guard that I call Ada. And they sort of teach you the ropes and repeating the things that you of course learned in classroom training, but kind of seeing how it actually works. Mm -hmm. Most of the learning you do, you get on the job. In this publicity tour, I get asked, did they teach you these things about the arts? How does that work? And it's like, no, you just learn. You learn (laughs) because you're, yeah, yeah, you learn, you're out there, you're talking to people, you're reading the labels, you're going on your breaks maybe to the Watson Library and reading up, or at least I did. Mostly you're learning just by looking. It's a unique form of learning because I feel like most people don't have quite as much space and time as we have to kind of try to think our own original thoughts about this stuff. You had some really fun observations about like the types of visitors or people that came there thinking they were going to see Mona Lisa, right? Or that they thought dinosaurs would be there. (laughs) And you're very kind in explaining to people maybe the misconceptions or whatever. What are some of the things that stood out to you in terms of reactions or needing to educate people on what to expect there? I never held it against people who came in not knowing what the heck was going on because (laughs) if you had me walk into an auto body shop or something, I would not know what was going on either. I mean, all of us have vast areas of sort of ignorance. And I found that that was a very fun aspect of the job because those types of people are the ones who are going to talk to you because someone who feels as if they know, you know, I've, I've been here 50 times. They, <laughs> oftentimes they aren't going to talk to you. Sometimes they do. But those people who are truly spun around mm-hmm. and don't know if things are real, don't know why this stuff existed. How is it possible? You know, the paint on my house fades in, you know, a few years. Why mm-hmm. is this 500 years? Those sorts of people are oftentimes very open to having these, you know, open-hearted kind of mm-hmm. conversations about this stuff. 
stuff. And it would remind me to kind of be wide eyed in the same way that they're wide eyed. Yeah. Cause I think that that should be how we all feel in the mat. We should all feel spun around inside that place yeah. because the reality is none of us have our feet on the ground when it comes to every culture in the world and all the beautiful things and all the philosophies and all, I mean, all of us should feel yeah. vastly ignorant. Yeah. One of the highlights of the book that I really enjoyed is your kind of tribe of fellow guards. And I loved how you said the glory of unskilled work is that people with fantastic range of skills and backgrounds work in them. And you contrasted that with white collar jobs where maybe you're with a cluster of people who have similar education and interests. Tell me about how important that tribe of friends was and was it instrumental in the length of time that you spent a decade there? Oh, absolutely. I think when I first started, what I sort of prized about the job was its solitude, its quiet, its being this sort of almost invisible figure in a dark suit who stood around in the corners and just looked at the arts and everything. But as I remained there longer, you know, when that acute sort of shell-shocked feeling kind of subsided, then I began to realize this is an incredible place in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that it's incredible is there are more than 500 guards that work there. And when it's open, you know, there might be 300 guards on the floor. And these guards are from every country you can imagine and every sort of different background. There's not one archetypal guard in any way, shape or form. It's just almost like just a map of New York that you just put over the Met. And oh yeah, I made great, great friends. And it's cool because you make friends, as you were saying, with people that are not just your same cast of mind. Like it just so happened that a few of my very good buddies were double my age, one from Togo and one from Guyana, mm -hmm. a lot of guards from Guyana at the Met. I don't know. I felt like I kind of found my voice and my cadence and how mm -hmm. to sort of be a grown up with these fellow grown ups there. Yeah. I just did an event on Monday at the Met for the guards and these retirees came out to my thing, you know. Mm -hmm. and what did you talk about with them? Oh, you know, just what we always talk about, okay. <laughs> basketball and everything else. No, everything, everything. The guards that sort of feature in my book, I've remained very close to, and we have a sort of gathering where every month or so we, we get together. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Great. Love to hear it. I felt like when I was reading through your book, it served as something of a crash course in art history. You discuss everything from Greek antiquities to Egyptian mummies, medieval art, Chinese silk paintings, African art, contemporary art. I especially enjoyed the chapter on the Guise Ben quilts. I felt like you did such a skillful job of weaving together themes about life and death and how various cultures celebrate and interpret these themes. How helpful was that in your own journey as you were healing from this traumatic life event and also, were you continuously researching the themes and the genres that interested you? Because you go pretty in depth. The interaction with works of art from all different periods and all different cultures was very important for me because I love to be in a place where it felt numinous, where it felt like you were being directed to think about things that are large or that are transcendent or that are elemental or anything else. And it becomes quickly clear when you're at the Met that you have all of these different cultures who have thought about these questions about life and death and the gods and the forces in our universe and what it is, what is this universe, what is the story here, and about beauty and the fact that we obviously as humans have this unbelievable capacity to create beauty and also to apprehend beauty, apprehend it in nature and apprehend it in the things that we as a species do, whatever the case. And I do feel like I had this unique opportunity to say, well, I'm going to spend eight hours today in Greek art and maybe I'll spend another eight hours tomorrow and another eight hours tomorrow, or maybe I'll zap to, you know, the West African arts or whatever the case may be. And to really take that seriously and say, okay, well, you know, I was on the floor for 2000 days and in those 2000 days, like, what can I make of this stuff? Not that I can in a sort of conclusionary, conclusory, whatever that word is, sense, <laughs> yeah. sort of make something of it, but, you know, try my hardest. And then, of course, when I was writing the book, I also was researching to remind myself of things and to kind of get a little more depth to it and figuring out how I could shape these chapters to bring out something about the art as well as just talking about my first person experience. 
when you wrote about Guy's Bend, was it Michelangelo that you put in that same chapter? Yeah. So I th- thought that was great. Tell me more about that. <laughs> oh, good. So I, I went on a paternity leave and then I came back and the first big show, I think, after I was back was this Michelangelo drawings show. It's just an extraordinary show and a blockbuster, you know, that gets thousands of people to come in every day, but also has this incredible intimacy, in particular at a time when I think I was thinking a lot about how damn hard it is to raise this son. I mean, just brutally hard. And it's cool to study Michelangelo because this is a guy who obviously what we think of as a supreme sort of colossus of art. But this is also a guy who found his craft very difficult. And you're seeing all of his preparatory sketches and the amount of disappointment that he had, amount of people pulling out the rug on his projects, you know, him not being able to complete his projects the way that he wanted. And over the course of this 70 year long career, that process of art was very striking in that show. Shortly after that show closed, they had this quilt exhibition, these quilts from G's Bend. And I similarly had just this feeling, you know, these are quilts where you can literally see the stitching on them. Mm -hmm. These are made by women from rural Alabama and the Jim Crow South who led in very different ways than Michelangelo, incredibly hard lives. But in a similar way, in some ways of what was going on in Florence, they all were clearly pushing each other. There was this tradition that formed for one reason or another. They're all sunning out their quilts and they're all kind of trying to one-up each other or have these bursts of creativity. And these quilts that they're making have a purpose of keeping their children's warm, but they also are pushing themselves to make them unbelievable believably just beautiful and kind of, you know, almost bizarre in their intensity. It seemed obvious to me to connect that to what I had just seen in the Michelangelo show, that sort of craft level. I found it very moving. There was one story in particular, I think, that you were telling about a woman who um, had suffered from depression and she just wasn't very social. And I just couldn't believe that amidst those challenges, people would still think about making art. And I guess that's another theme that sort of runs through the book is the challenges of making it and also just how natural it is, the instinct to create for any human. Yeah, it's very mysterious. Loretta Petway, who you're referring to, she had an incredibly difficult life and she's still alive. She's one of the oh, few. Oh, she is. Well, she's one okay. of the few people I talk about who's still alive, but she doesn't travel to the Met to see a show. You know, Mm -hmm. she stays in G's Bend. But yes, as you said, I mean, what is it that is in us that drives us to make things that are just way better than they have any right to be, Mm -hmm. which for me is one sort of definition of art, just something that is better, that is more beautiful, that is more delicate, that has more care or diligence or something poured into it than we would have any right to expect. Yeah. And that's certainly true of these quilts, but it's true of all sorts of things. You know, why are people so good at playing piano? It's just absurd. <laughs> you know, the, the levels of iteration that that's taken. Yeah. But clearly there's something in our species, you know, the great apes aren't doing that. Mm. It's something that we do. <laughs> and I think that one remarkable thing about the Met is that you can go there to just sort of feel proud of your own species. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. I could go on and on about the different in-depth, like the Chinese silk paintings, when you talked about how there's no making a mistake, like just as a example of that. Is there any other areas of art that you feel like we need to highlight? I guess the area that I keep coming back to is the old master paintings. Right. Just because Well, that was my first assigned home section. Mm -hmm. So I spent my first four months there. And then after that, I would spend maybe half my days or more there. And I was very pleased to be there because very clearly there's this emphasis on the passion, which is an old word that means suffering. Mm -hmm. And clearly this sort of emotion is very close to the bone in those paintings at a time where Europe was very poor and the bubonic plague and maybe killed off, you know, a third of everybody. And at the time, my brother had recently died, and I saw in those pictures this just incredible poignance because they're so sad, but they're so beautiful. Mm. There's this luminousness to them, and there is just this feeling that your heart kind of brims at the same time as your heart breaks when Mm -hmm. you look at those pictures. And that, to me, replicates the feeling that I felt like I had often tapped into in my past, you know, Mm -hmm. year or so. That was a special part of the book. 
Towards the end of the book, I was starting to get this sense that you're feeling a little restless. You can't always have a Sunday off. You can't always be off during the summer when your wife and your children are off. And then beyond the scheduling limitations, I was also getting the sense that you were kind of more looking outwards, like the Met almost seemed like a protective shell for you in a lot of the years that you were there. I know they say you went to the most beautiful place in the world to find solace. And you're talking about plotting to introduce your own children to the big city and the wide world, which you describe as both daunting and exciting. So my question for you there is, do you think either in retrospect or at the time that it was a parallel to starting to move forward from loss or that you were starting to feel like you were healing? Also another example of how the Met helped you to heal. At that point, I had been there, you know, almost 10 years. And I do feel as if having my children change things because prior to that, it was very easy to go to work and I sort of existed in this sort of perfectly quiet little space. And mm -hmm. I would, you know, just be writing down my thoughts when I went home on the train and everything was very kind of I don't know, very sort of perfect in that way. And then you have kids and like nothing is remotely perfect. Like it's just <laughs> yeah. ridiculous. Your life becomes just a ridiculous slog and struggle. So I would appreciate going to work and having sort of this time away from the slog and struggle. But it also just made me realize that there's one kind of whole half of life that is slog and struggle. Mm -hmm. That is sort of the need to go out there and build something and make something and work. And then in a way, this sort of perfection that I had on post was just something that to this day, I very much miss, but also maybe not the best thing for me to just remain in indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I, of course, in the book, didn't want to make it like to meta or inside baseball. But I also had this idea that like, well, maybe I should try to write about this. I mean, mm -hmm. I've always written. So that is also a sort of a parallel because writing a book is also a ridiculous slog and struggle and it's very hard and mm -hmm. it just tears your brain to shreds. Mm -hmm. It's very different than remaining on post and looking at beautiful Botticelli's all day. Right. But I felt like I owed it to myself to try. How far into your tenure there did you start thinking about writing the book or was that after? I've always sort of written poetry and things, but it had never sort of congealed exactly what I wanted to write. I think I always had kind of, I don't know, head in the cloud sort of way that I did it. So while I was on the job, of course, I was thinking about ways that maybe I could write about this because this seems interesting. But not until five or six years in, I suppose, did I start thinking of a book. And I thought in particular at first about sort of a guard's guide to the Met. At first I, I thought it. it would be little anecdotes and stories mixed in with things about the art. But I started to write that and pretty quickly it seemed just like a mess. And it seemed like the more interesting and involving thing for other people to do would be to write a first person story about what it's like to be a guard. And in order to write a first person story about art and a subjective story about the experience of art. Of course, I would have to explain who I am. So it sort of broadened the project to also have to be about what had brought me to the Met and the whole shebang, really. Mm -hmm. There's one piece of what I felt was 14 karat gold in there. Any of us in the art world that ever knew or encountered Philippe de Montebello knew that he was like just the most august, well-spoken, elegant man. So the part where you're talking about when you're in a bar with your friends and one of the guards refers to him as Philly cheesesteak and yes. that nobody can keep it together. Was that an ongoing thing or a one-off joke? It, no, it was <laughs> ongoing after he said that. He actually doesn't even know where he came up with that. He thinks he heard it from somebody else. I was asking him, he, he was like, I didn't hear that from you. I was like, no, you did not hear that from me. But oh, it's just hilarious. Because yeah. it's hilarious in the same way as like, you know, you know, just like the hugest guy, you know, and people call him tiny. Like, it's like that. He's the least Philly cheesesteak yeah. man. The sketches, they're just wonderful space throughout the book. What was the inspiration and the process for that? It was done by an artist named Maya McMahon. She's very talented. I just found her on Instagram. Oh, great. Because okay. uh, I knew a, a New Yorker cartoonist. And I said, how do I find someone who it would be just very talented at doing sort of sketching, like they're sitting in a museum and just yeah. sketching things. And he said, well, I don't know, go on Instagram and try out like museum sketch, sketchbook, <laughs> things like that. And I found her and that's precisely the sort of thing she does, although she also does all sorts of things. Right now she's doing character development on some dragon show for the WB, something like that. Okay. 
<laughs> but yeah, I was very pleased to work with her yeah. and she was a delight to work with. She would sort of send me her ideas and we would talk about it. And Yeah. Anybody who can try to replicate a Michelangelo sketch is uh, obviously very impressive. It's like the perfect compliment. They don't take away from the text and vice versa. They sort of like work together really beautifully, I think. Thanks. Yeah. I felt strongly that I did not want to have reproductions in the book mm -hmm. because I think there's something both underwhelming about a reproduction. You know, if I'm talking about the great beauty of this painting, yeah. then you look at this little two inch color or black and white thing, and you're like, oh, that's not so hot. But then also there's something very literal about that. And the book is so subjective. And mm -hmm. I thought sketches would feel subjective. Yeah. How did the museum respond either after they first learned that you were working on the book? Like, did you alert them? I'm going to write about my time here as a guard. Like, did they know? No, they didn't know. Yeah, okay. they didn't know until the book was done. At that point, we made some overtures just, you know, to hopefully get an embrace from them. And we yeah. did. We did. Oh, great. Yeah, I was a little nervous because I didn't know whether they would try to throw wrenches in the gears of the process just because it's not something they control. And they'd be like, wait right. a minute, what's going on here? But, you know, obviously it's not a tell-all and that's not the point of it. They've been very kind from Dan Weiss, the president, to, you know, all sorts of different people have been very kind. Your former guard co-workers, when did they first know? Did you talk to them during the process? What kind of reactions they had? All of my good friends knew, but yeah, most people didn't know. Okay. I, I made the decision to change everybody's name, not because I speak poorly of anybody. I speak poorly yeah, of don't. nobody, <laughs> but just because I don't know. I didn't want to have this patchwork of I use some real names, but other people I can't track down. So I use fake names. I just like change them all. Yeah. It's not important. Yeah. So I think everyone's had good fun reading the book and being like, oh, that's read for, you know, <laughs> um, but no, I've been very, very pleased because so many of them are artists. So many mm -hmm. are writers. At the event I did on Monday at the Met, I was interviewed by Louisa Lamb, who's a, a wonderful guard and, and a talented poet. And then that night we went to her open mic and the open mic was hosted by another guard and they had all these other people playing music and things. And it's a very sort of vibrant culture. So I think that not only those creative types, but all sorts of types getting slaps on the back. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So I know you're doing publicity for the book right now, but what are your plans? What's next for you? Yeah, I'm figuring it out. I'm doing tours of the Met and that's fun oh, that's not, yeah. from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So private tours and some public tours, because I'm trying to figure out a way to sort of, you know, I don't want to go back to an office job, certainly. So I want to remain on my feet, work part time and write the next book. I'm figuring out that balance now. So we ask this question a lot to art lovers and collectors. If you could steal one work from a museum, presumably we're talking about the Met, without getting caught, what would it be? Hmm. I mean, my sort of dodging answer, but it absolutely true is I don't need to steal anything. I don't need to, I mean, I don't need to take something from a public collection being enjoyed by everybody and put it in my dingy apartment in Brooklyn. I mean, I truly do not need to. I like the experience of going to a place yeah. and having the experience. That's a very original answer. Um, I like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the sense of just what a favorite is, I mean, I would say I love Peter Bruegel's The Harvest. Um, oh, yeah, which is an iconic painting. It's a painting that's wonderful as a guard because it's one of these huge window-like paintings that seems to just blast through the side of the wall out into an utterly different universe that you can kind of immerse yourself in. It's a painting that I think of some paintings as long lookers, meaning it really pays off because it just begins to shine and sparkle. It's just these golden fields of wheat and this green grass and these white, hot August sky and just the color harmony is just deep and just sort of steep in you as you look at that thing. Mm -hmm. And also this, just the geometry of it is so, so kind of charismatic for ways that's kind of hard to explain. And then you've got the peasants who are napping in the foreground and breaking bread. And there's something so sympathetic about them. Mm -hmm. So you have this painting that just seems to be about everything. It seems to be about these people living their lives in the foreground after they've broken from the day's labor and are sitting under a pear tree. And then it just sweeps back past these fields to this distant harbor and you see a church in the mid ground and then there are ships out in the harbor. It just seems to be about kind of the vast world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Do you collect any art? No, I mean, I do not, I do not have remotely enough money. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Me either, but I, but I felt I had to ask. Yes. <laughs> well, Patrick, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for coming on The Art Angle. Thank you very much, Eileen. I appreciate it. 
That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.